Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And this is our first podcast for 2019, and I'm very excited to get back into things and providing you with a lot more informative content. And in this episode, we have Eric Trexler on the show, and he's a researcher who is absolutely dominating at the moment. He's published 60 or more uh, research papers. He's doing a lot of great work out of the University of North Carolina, um, where his research has been heavily focused on how exercise and nutrition affect metabolism, performance, and body composition. And he's also the head of education at Str- Stronger by Science, uh, now working alongside Greg Knuckles in producing content and coaching. He's a natural bodybuilder, he's done powerlifting, he's a strength coach, and he currently holds certifications in sports nutrition and strength and conditioning. And he's a very, very intelligent uh, human being, and he's a, he's a great guy also, which uh, makes for even better listening. And before we get into things, just a few announcements. Uh, we have the Optimizing Body Composition Seminar, which we are taking around Australia, and we're going to be presenting on how to design effective systems to enhance physique development. Uh, we'll be presenting this seminar alongside our good friend, our fellow podcast host, uh, Danny Lennon of Sigma Nutrition. So make sure you check the link in the description box below uh, for seminar dates. We'll be going to Melbourne, Gold Coast, to Wollongong, Ballarat, Perth, and Sydney. So be sure to check that out and hopefully uh, we'll see you guys there. Uh, Also, the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference being held in June. Huge lineup. You guys are going to be spoiled with the quality of presentations and the practitioners and researchers we have uh, coming to talk to us about evidence-based practice. So really looking forward to that. You can find more details and secure your ticket via the link in the description box uh, below. Uh, And without further ado, let's get into this discussion with Eric Trexler. We talk about female body composition research as a lot of his work over the past 12 months has been heavily focused in assessing how females respond to various nutrition and training protocols and the implications of uh, these protocols for females, which is an area of research that is lacking a little bit. So it's great to see Eric really picking up the slack here uh, with his research group. And I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy this episode and get a lot out of it. So without further ado, I present to you Mr. Eric Trexler. So welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and today I'm very honored to have Eric Trexler on the show. I hope I pronounced that correctly, man. How you doing? Yep. I'm great, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Eric is probably the most proficient uh, publisher of scientific papers uh, that I've come across to date. I think uh, we were just talking off air and he published 40 papers across his PhD. Uh, and I was going through uh, doing a little bit of research for this episode, and he's got around 60 papers to his name, which is quite phenomenal. He's doing some some pretty good work uh, out of the University of North Carolina under Abby Smith Ryan, and they're focusing primarily on exercise, nutrition, and how that affects metabolism, performance, body composition, all these sorts of things. He's been a writer for uh, Lane Norton, who's been on the show before. Many of you guys who uh, will know who Lane is, obviously, um, and you're also doing some work uh, with Greg Knuckles, so. Tell me a little bit about, obviously, where you're at now, Eric, what you're doing, uh, and yeah, what's planned? Uh, yeah, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me on, and I want to preface uh, this whole podcast by saying it's midnight here, and I'm a morning person, so I'm stoked to be on, but if I ramble and get off topic and I don't answer the question you asked, just be rude. Just be like, Eric, that's not what I was talking about. Just ring me like bring me back into it and I'll try to catch up. No um, problem, but, but yeah, so like you mentioned, uh, I did my PhD with Abby Smith Ryan at UNC and I actually finished recently, um, mm-hmm. like a, a month ago maybe. Um, but yeah, during my time there, we published a lot just shy of like, you know, it was about 35, 40 ish papers with some that are kind of in review and a bunch of abstracts on top of that. So we published a lot and, uh, you know, we, we try to do a lot of work on dietary supplements, body composition. We've done a lot of research in female populations specifically. Um, but you asked about 
stuff with Greg. You know, previously I've written for Lane's website, which mm-hmm. has been a lot of fun. And I, I've loved working with Lane uh, in the past. He's been so great to me. Um, but now that I'm done with my PhD, the question was, where do I go from here? And I, I thought about taking a professor job. Uh, but instead, I'll be going into business with Greg Knuckles, and awesome. uh, the, the the website's called Stronger by Science. And over the next few months, I should be publishing a ton of content there. Uh, we'll be doing written stuff, audio stuff, um, and actually taking on clients. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, to to this point in my career, most of my coaching has been either informal or not in physique athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of decided before I wanted to really make a living off of the stuff I do with physique athletes that I wanted to turn myself pro first to be sure I could do it before I tell somebody I can do it for them. Uh, and also I wanted to finish my PhD up and actually do some studies on bodybuilders to make sure that my personal experience was also showing up in the data we collect so that just to get a better idea of exactly what we see across multiple people. Cause I know what I feel when I prep. But I need to know what other people feel mm. based on not just what they say, but also taking some blood, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. so um, not just yeah, N so equals what, one, what having, having a few doing. more people to uh, be able to assess and see how they respond to various things. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, so that's what I've been doing and what mm-hmm. I'll be doing in the near future. Awesome, man. And yeah, tell me a little bit more about your work at UNC uh, and I guess how you got into research, and more specifically to what we're going to discuss today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, female body composition and contest prep, because that is uh, where your work has sort of been heavily focused in, in female athletes, at least for the last uh, year or so, especially 2018. Um, you know, how did you get into research, and sort of what was the catalyst for you to start you know, looking into bodybuilding um, and wanting to know more about that? Yeah, don't let me forget to address the female part, okay? Cool. So, so part one, how did I get into research and bodybuilding research? So for some people, like, get into research and they're like, oh, I like this body comp stuff. Maybe I'll try bodybuilding. For me, it was the opposite. So I was really into bodybuilding and I was so into it that I wanted to understand it better. Um, so bodybuilding got me into research rather than the other way around. And uh, I actually reached out to Lane when I was pretty young. Like I must have been about 20. Lane didn't know me. He had no reason to give me the time of day, but he did anyway. And I was like, Lane, I love what you do. I love bodybuilding. I want to do research on it. Do you know of anywhere I could make that happen? And he was the one that led me to to UNC, which is where I ended up going. So I actually did a, a bodybuilding prep of like – at basically as I moved there for grad school, mm-hmm. like I did one of my shows that season before I moved and one after. So like within that three week span, I moved and started grad school. And uh, man, I just showed up. That prep was brutal. It was the first time I'd ever gotten like lean enough that I should have been on stage. Yeah. Uh, my, my first prep was every it was like everybody's first prep. It was lean enough to look good, like at the beach, but not <laughs> not to get on stage. So, um, that was my first real prep where I was, it was brutal toward the end. And I was like, man, I'm, I'm so intrigued by this process, by what I'm feeling. And at the time it sucked, but I was like, I want to understand what's happening physiologically, but more importantly, what we can do in the future to help people have a more effective prep, less side effects, recover better, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, now when it comes to the female research, um, one thing that you'll notice when you look at the li- the literature on most things in our field, mm-hmm. uh, strength training, nutrition, weight loss, a lot of it is done specifically in males. And the problem with that is that men and women are not totally the same, uh, obviously. I mean, like especially when it comes to hormonal differences that dictate a lot when it comes to performance and body composition. So – What happens in the research world is my kind of perspective on why that's the case. I don't think it's because people don't care about women. Um, That's not a strong hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I think the the more likely thing is when you're going to start a study and it's going to be on a mixture of men and women, the kind of initial response you get from people is, 
well, they're too different. You shouldn't lump them together uh-huh. like it's one generalized response. The other thing is when you say, well, we're just going to study women, they say, how are you going to control for the menstrual cycle? Uh-huh. Um, are you going to make sure everybody's eumenorrheic? Are you going to include people that are on hormonal birth control? Are they all going to be on it or none of them? Um, and if you don't have a good way to control it, then people will – the thought is that reviewers will not accept your work if you haven't thoroughly controlled for it. So I think it's mainly that people don't want to deal with that. Um, I think our lab group is of the opinion that we have a responsibility to either deal with that or just accept it as a limitation, one or the other. But we we can't just keep not studying half of the world population. So um, that's kind of what got our lab into it. And and for a while there, I was the only male in our lab group. (laughs) So... Um, so yeah, it was, it was a group, uh, with, with a strong female presence who wanted to answer some very female specific research questions. And, and yeah, it was cool to be a part of that stuff because the field needed it. It was the right thing to do. Yeah, man, that's fantastic. And I think a lot of coaches and athletes are definitely glad that, you know, somebody stood up to obviously start, you know, delving into that demographic uh, specifically because we we do need it. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about some of your papers. Um, and the one that I wanted to, to chat about was nutrient timing and on training adaptations in resistance trained females, uh, one of the publications from 2018, if memory serves. Um, so yeah, do you want to explain to the listeners what you were looking for in this study, uh, what you were assessing, um, and everything that came uh, out of this particular study? Yeah, so that study was uh, kind of headed up by one of our students named Alexis P. Hoker. Uh, very, very good student, good researcher. She's doing her PhD in Pittsburgh now. Um, so this was her master's thesis project, and she put so much work into it and, and really did a great job. Um, she's really into lifting. There's There's been several studies in men looking at the timing of, of protein mostly um, surrounding the workout, before the workout, after the workout, or really separating and doing workouts in a fasted state with no protein after. And the, the general concept is looking at, in this case, it was a blend of protein and carbohydrate, but if we give that before a workout, after a workout, or nowhere near a workout, basically they get neither treatment. How does that affect their responses to a six week training intervention? And so for for the training intervention, we use something called high intensity resistance training, H-I-R-T, which seems vague because like it's kind of a it's a term that's common in the literature that that is basically uh, a series of resistance training exercises done at a high intensity with relatively short rest. But it's kind of a, you know, get in, get out, throw a bunch of weight around type workout to to really maximize the efficiency uh, and not ask them to be hanging around the gym several days a week for several weeks for several hours. Um, so it, it's really nice for, to stimulate some muscle growth and get them in and out of, of the lab and not ask for too much of their time. Um, but yeah, so there's all these studies that were done in in men, but not many in women looking at that particular question. Um, and before I go on, I want to mention um, some people don't like referring to like using men or males interchangeably or, or referring to women as females. I don't mean to like depersonalize it. It's just a pure biology, male, female. So if that offends you, please understand why we use those terms that way. But uh, looking at females, uh, like I said, just hasn't really been done much. And so when it comes to males, I think there's pretty much a, a general understanding that protein around the workout is important. Um, the specific, you know, whether you get it immediately before, immediately after doesn't seem to ma- matter that much as long as you're getting protein near that workout, which, which kind of theoretically makes sense because, you know, back in the day, I remember it was like, you have to drink your shake the second you finish working out because as far as our mind is concerned, like once I swallow it, it's into my muscles. But that's just not how it works, right? So coursing through your bloodstream after the workout's done, the stuff you drank right after your workout is still there a couple hours later. The timing is not as specific as when it hits your tongue, you know? And so uh, 
the research in men would lead us to believe it doesn't really matter that much before or after. As long as you're getting protein near that workout, you're stimulating protein synthesis with the workout, you're going to get stronger, you're put, going to put on muscle. And, uh, you know, with, with Alexis's study, it's not like every single outcome across the board was, you know, dramatically affected by the intervention. But generally, the results did kind of fall in line with that, where before or after, not a huge deal, but it certainly appeared to be a good idea to get protein. In this case, it was a protein carbohydrate drink somewhere in proximity to the workout. And I would make the case, you know, based on other studies, based on work in the field, if you don't have to choose before or after, go with both, um, you know, have a few protein containing meals a day and sneak your workout somewhere in the middle and your peri workout nutrition needs are pretty much going to be met. Awesome. Awesome. And I guess, yeah, something that a lot of people uh, worry about is the performance benefits that pre-workout nutrition may have, you know, training fasted and all these sorts of things and the differences between obviously uh, the importance of nutrient timing when in uh, hypercaloric conditions versus hypocaloric conditions. So I guess, do you want to sort of extrapolate from your findings and discuss, you know, where you sort of think, uh, you know, these recommendations would fit best uh, depending on energy balance? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the fasted training, I've never really seen a good data driven argument for it. Usually the best you're going to do with fasted training is that it's not worse than fed training in terms of your long term outcomes. You know, you might find a study here or there that shows acutely, oh, there was a little bit more oxidation. But in the course of, you know, a 24 hour cycle of oxidi oxidizing nutrients and consuming nutrients, that tends to come out in the wash. We, we don't really worry about that too much in terms of body comp and, and my concern with that is long term if you don't perform well in a fasted state i don't want you to have crappy training quality mm -hmm. you know like there, there's been some studies to borrow from a similar field of research but there's been some studies on like carbohydrate availability and like purposely doing glycogen depleted workouts and even in in those circumstances, they very carefully manage how often that's done and what type of workouts take place during that because they don't want you to train like crap consistently. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a huge fan of fasted training. The only exception is uh, if you really struggle training with any kind of food or even shakes in your stomach. That's the one case where I could possibly see the justification that you're like, listen, if I train with anything in my stomach, I just feel sick. So I restrict caloric intake within a few hours before before my training. I get that. Um, but yeah, when, when it comes to pre-workout nutrition, I, I think fasted is probably not the way to go for most people. Getting some kind of carbohydrate that can digest fairly rapidly is mm -hmm. good if you're eating right before. If you want to eat a slower digesting digesting carbohydrate source, take it, you know, ingest it a couple hours before so it has time to kind of settle in. Uh, but yeah, I think really just general good, good pre-workout nutrition practices are make sure you have carbohydrate to use, especially if you're fueling high intensity work and get a reasonable amount of protein and then get some protein after. Awesome. And sorry to sort of circle back to your paper, um, but you mentioned in your paper there are known physiological differences between males and females, um, you know, especially as it relates to resistance training um, and some of the like differing metabolic characteristics, hormones and things like that, uh, you know, were, were one of the primary reasons you conducted this paper to sort of tease that out. Do you want to explain to listeners, I guess, you know, at least how these sorts of differences between males and females, I know Greg is like super into, you know, gender differences and whatnot, how that, uh, I guess, drove your research or at least uh, directed things on your end? Yeah, I mean, I know um, w with this particular study, the, they looked at substrate utilization occurring after some of the workouts as kind of a secondary measurement. And I know you, you mentioned Greg's talked about this a lot. Um, you know, there, there are some differences in how men and women use substrates both at rest and during exercise. Um, so, you know, during exercise, uh, a lot of times men will burn more carbohydrate, women will burn more fat. Uh, and then post-exercise, that kind of flip-flops. Mm -hmm. um, 
for the study that we did, you know, we looked at those as kind of secondary measurements um, to take a look at. Uh, I don't believe we found anything particularly notable when it came to like energy expenditure or respiratory exchange ratio, which is basically a, a kind of a proxy for looking at substrate utilization. Um, when, when it comes to those substrate differences, I think it can guide general kind of daily uh, macronutrient distributions. So like, you know, we know that, you know, if you're a man, you tend to burn more carbohydrate during exercise. So when you're doing a really heavy push of high intensity work and you're a male athlete and you're in like a really intense training phase, you kind of know that you need to bump your carbs up a little bit more. If you're a female, you can probably get away with not bumping it up quite as much. Um, but I caution against, um, you know, it's important to acknowledge certain differences, but with that particular one, you know, it's not like we have to treat males and females as if they're separate species. Mm -hmm. You know, th these are notable things to keep in mind, just like with how females are a bit more fatigue resistant uh, when it comes to higher repetition work. They can handle it better. Um, so that doesn't mean you're going to program everything around it. But it is a consideration when it comes into drafting that program and saying with this load, how many reps do I think they're going to get? You have to keep in mind the subtle male versus female differences. So they're not the types of things that, you know, I wouldn't say like this research project was aimed at, you know, completely mm, exploiting yes. that subtle difference and showing that this is a completely different ball game. The, the, the real premise was based on what we know in men, do we see that transition over to the more the longer term adaptations mm -hmm. in females? And in this case, we saw that it either didn't matter or it favored the general practice of having that carbohydrate yeah. and protein in proximity to the workout. Awesome, man. And moving forward, I think a paper published prior to uh, the nutrient timing adaptations and resistance training uh, for females was uh, looking into body composition and neuromuscular performance through a contest uh, prep and it, it wasn't just a contest prep it was the prep itself well, before the prep during the prep and after the prep if memory serves and this was one of your more uh, popular papers um, I, I remember checking out some of the stats on on research gate and this one was uh, pretty popular but uh, from my understanding you were looking to the techniques that measure body composition and obviously the role that uh, performance plays uh, you know in maintaining uh, lean mass and all that sort of thing. So do you want to dive into this one uh, and how the study was set up, um, the methods and obviously uh, the conclusions and the findings of the paper? Yeah, so this paper was really the brainchild of Grant Tinsley, who's at uh, Texas Tech University. Mm -hmm. And Grant does incredible work. I really like Grant. It was cool to work with him. Um, Every time I see him at a conference, he tells me something that's really, really, really damn smart. Um, but uh, so he, basically what was going on was he had, a, you know, a female figure competitor that was local doing a prep. And, and you know, the, the idea was to measure kind of all across the contest prep between the competitions and then the recovery afterwards. Um, and Grant is like a body composition expert. So he used things like mm -hmm. I, the, 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 the main outcome was, was a four compartment, uh, you know, body composition model that uses total body water and DEXA combined, mm -hmm. which is something that our labs used, uh, quite a bit in the past. And what's really cool about that is, um, what a lot of times when it comes to body comp, you're basically left with the assumption that, you know, total body water doesn't matter. But especially when it comes to physique athletes, it's mm. cool to keep keep an eye on it because they do have some body water fluctuations. But, you know, like your typical bod pod or DEXA without accounting for that, you're just assuming that nothing's changed. Whereas with a physique athlete, you'd like to keep an eye on that if you can, if you have the technology available. Um, so basically we looked at, you know, body composition changes, metabolic rate using indirect calorimetry. Um, Grant has access to a really cool squat dynamometer. So usually when you talk dynamometry in the lab, you're talking single joint movements, mm -hmm. leg extension, uh, you know, some kind of like arm curl, something like that. But at Texas Tech, they have a really cool uh, squat dynamometer, which uh, unfortunately I've never had the the pleasure of using it, but you, you could have a lot of fun in the lab uh, working with that. Um, cause it, it's just awesome. Cause it's like 
an absolute all out maximal squat type exercise yeah. versus just doing like a leg extension. It's fun for the researchers, um, not the participants. What's that? It's fun for the researchers, not so much the participants. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Usually that's inversely related. Whatever the researchers enjoy, the, yeah. the participants totally hate. Um, but yeah, so, so with that project, the idea was, um, you know, we wrote a paper quite a few years ago on metabolic adaptation in, in mm -hmm. it was for the generalized athlete, but really when I was writing it, I'm thinking physique athletes, bodybuilders, we did a, we did a study with a, uh, a case study with a male part, uh, uh, physique athlete. And now this was one with a female. And the idea is to kind of look at similar objective measurements and how they change throughout the prep. Because one thing that we see is uh, when, it, when it comes to some of the, the female case studies in prep athletes, the results are a little bit divergent. Mm -hmm. So uh, like in, in the case of our study, the one we're talking about now that uh, Tinsley is the first author, um, she actually gained some lean mass throughout the course of prep you do not really see that in, in the male mm. contest prep literature. Um, you don't see that at all. And, and sometimes you see some pretty dramatic losses in lean mass. So um, it was kind of cool. We also didn't see a particularly dramatic drop off in resting metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. It existed, but it wasn't like enormous. Whereas with some of the, some of the male preps that we see, we see much more marked drops. Um, but in this case, the athlete, even when she started the prep, excuse me, when she started the prep, she really was a little bit under what we would have expected it to be in the first place. Mm. So that, that could have been part of why we didn't see a huge drop. But, um, yeah, one of the things that really jumped out in this paper was, like I said, didn't lose lean mass, actually gained a little bit throughout prep, but the neuromuscular function mm. tanked, mm. um, which I, I, I remember when Grant first sent the data and I'm looking at it and my initial reaction was, well, that doesn't make sense because lean tissue makes force. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? Like you, you'd expect with like really dramatic force drop offs, like, oh, they probably lost a ton of muscle. There's a bunch of muscle loss that makes sense. But then I thought about it more and I was like, that actually does match my experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, that's not the goal is to, you know internalize everything to how it affects me or how I experienced it. But, you know, I remembered vividly during my, my most recent prep, I looked in the mirror, I had DEXAs that I took on myself and I'm like, I have not lost a lot of lean mass, but man, am I weak in the gym? I mean, my neuro neuromuscular performance was trash. Mm -hmm. And so this was a really cool, one of my favorite things about this case study is it shows it's very tempting to see that performance drop off in the gym and say, oh man, I lost muscle, muscle. Loss, I'm yeah. screwed. Um, but in this case, and by the way, when we say lean mass, it's not just muscle, mm, but yeah. you would expect with muscle loss, you'll also see lean mass loss unless you like lost a ton of muscle and grew a third kidney, like <laughs> they're, they're going to be kind of related. So, um, that's probably one of my favorite things about this paper. And, uh, there's a lot of reasons for why that could be. Um, that was my next usually, question. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it kind of writes itself, right? You're like, so yeah. what, what actually happened then? It, if you got way weaker and your performance suffers, but you haven't lost lean mass, what's happening? And there's a few possible things. So glycogen depletion is just the way you live in contest prep. Like late in prep, you are depleted mm -hmm. essentially all day, every day. Um, that's kind of what happens with when you're losing significant, significant amounts of weight. Um, what, what's even more interesting is that glycogen does not get depleted in a completely uniform way. And what you'll see is that there are different distinct areas that glycogen gets stored within the muscle. And one particular storage site is very close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so in muscle, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, is basically responsible for initiating calcium release, which essentially makes force production happen. So there's been a group that did a ton of really, really cool research on this. And they suggest that when we deplete glycogen in the muscle, we preferentially deplete that part first, the part that's close to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so that even modest glycogen uh, depletion might have pretty meaningful effects on force output 
because those sarcoplasmic reticul reticulum, they're, they're not functioning the way they typically would. Um, so it could be a glycogen depletion thing, certainly. Another interesting facet could be uh, certainly just general training yourself into the ground, which everyone does in prep. Because a lot of people think, you know, I'll either ramp things up closer to the showtime because I'm very motivated or I'll just keep doing the same throughout prep. But late in prep, your recovery ability is completely tanked. Mm. You know, you're not eating. A lot of people have really severe sleep problems late in prep. You're doing a lot more cardio. I mean, your recovery is really not the same as it used to be. So a lot of times, even keeping a similar workload throughout prep will actually make your recovery become insufficient. So it could be an overtraining type thing. Another thing it could be, I mentioned aerobic exercise or endurance exercise. There, there's some mixed literature when it comes to the interference effect, right? And so the interference effect is basically if you're someone who is resistance trained and you add in endurance training, will that endurance training start interfering with your strength gains or your hypertrophy gains? And the reason that there's mixed literature is because it's very contextually mediated. And uh, I was actually really nervous. I was just in Finland a few months ago and I was talking about this in front of like Professor Hakkinen, Professor Atianen. And like these are people who wrote the book on concurrent training and the interference effect. <laughs> so I was like just sweating the whole time. I was like putting up figures from their studies and telling them what it means and just be like, please, God, don't disagree with me because I'm not going to stand up to you. <laughs> like you've been studying this since 10 years before I was born. You know what I mean? I'm going to shut up and let you talk. But uh, actually, they, it was really well received, which made me <laughs> very happy. But That's it's awesome. very, con yeah, the interference effect is very contextual. And what you see when you look at the literature is when it's done within reason, when the strength training volume and intensity and the aerobic training volume and intensity and frequency are both reasonable, you don't really see a huge interference effect. But when you start adding on really high volumes or really high frequencies of aerobic training on top of an already pretty loaded resistance training schedule, that's when you're more likely to see interference. And the interference effect affects power more than it affects strength, and it affects strength more than it affects hypertrophy. Um, and and that, I think that's a pretty fair assessment of the literature as a whole. And so what that means is we would expect with a prep athlete who's not recovering because no prep athlete <laughs> is really recovering, and they're putting on you know pretty high resistance training volume with pretty high aerobic exercise on top of that, we would expect their power to absolutely tank. So when we look at our study with rate of force development, it was affected way more than just the, the general like peak torque measurements. So that's kind of in line with that hypothesis. And then the, the hypertrophy was not really affected that much by that interference effect, which is, again, pretty in line with, with what people have been finding for years in, in that area of research. So, yeah, that particular finding, when I first saw it in the data, I was like, I don't I don't get what's happening. And then you kind of think through it and you're like, yeah, yeah, that that actually lines up pretty, pretty well. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting. I find this kind of stuff uh, really, really cool. And I guess one of the other interesting findings was that after the prep had finished, um, neuromuscular performance, the decrements remained below baseline um, even once resting metabolic rate had returned, um, you know, I think body weight had returned. I can't remember. I'm not a science nerd. I just, I just remember the, the uh, nuts and bolts of it. Um, well, but, I mean, you're just a normal person who doesn't have this, like, <laughs> no. memory. Yeah, I wish I, I, I did, man. Like, I, so I envy you, you guys on the show, so much. Right? Greg yeah, he's, he's a freak, man. <laughs> he's I, crazy. I feel so bad about myself when I hang out with him because, like, yeah, <laughs> I remember themes. I remember ideas. I don't remember. He he remembers every decimal point in a paper he's read. It, it's just crazy. Yeah, he's a phenomenal man. But yeah, that was one of the other interesting findings because um, you would expect, you know, once somebody's body weight comes back, uh, obviously resting mo metabolic rate uh, climbs up and they start to transition out of the prep into the off season that you'd see this 
almost rapid return in uh, you know performance, but that wasn't the case in this particular uh, study. Do you want to sort of touch on that and I guess outline what the potential mechanisms behind that are? Um, yeah, I mean it's it's tricky. So a lot of times with these types of studies, uh, anytime you're talking physique athletes, if we're finally at a point where we look at recovery, which is good. Uh, I, f- I feel like for a long time in the bodybuilding world, it wasn't something that was talked about. It was like you live for competition day. And if you happen to survive beyond that, you'll just deal with whatever happens then. You know what I mean? Like it, it was kind of like, uh, sometimes when I present slides about this, I'll just show like, there's a picture of a sprinter in a race. It looks like a, like a hundred meter dash or something literally diving at the finish line. And I feel like a lot of people treat their prep that way. Like I'm only worried about getting to the finish line. Forget the fact that I have to go back to like work and like living with my family and training again after the show. They like, don't even think about what life is mm. after prep. Um, now with this particular study, yeah, we saw body weight start to return back to normal. Um, we saw metabolic rate start to return back to normal. Uh, now performance did return in that general trend. Mm -hmm. So it did not get fully back to, you know, a hundred percent, but it started, you know, there was a point like during the shows and right before the shows where it really, really, really dropped off. So it was starting to trend back in that direction, but it did not actually get all the way back. So one of the things that's frustrating is people say, when do I, when am I recovered from my prep and recovery entails a lot of things, you know, Mm -hmm. and how you define recovered affects what timeline I'm going to quote you. So, you know, you, you never look at the result of one case study and say, well, it took her 32 weeks. So it takes you 32 weeks, right? You kind of triangulate all the data from, small studies and bodybuilders and other case studies, it certainly seems to depend on, first of all, when you return to a normal body weight or at least close to it. Uh, When we see that happen, we see metabolic rates starting to come back. We see hormones starting to come back, but they usually aren't all the way up either. So when you look at, at certain uh, case studies, uh, there, I think there's mostly male case studies that look at a, a pretty broad hormone panel, but it's not atypical to see a person get back to the normal body weight. Metabolic rate's pretty close to, to normal, but the testosterone still hasn't caught up quite yet. Um, and when it comes to, you know, female hormone related recovery, you know, restoration of a normal menstrual cycle often it's going to take a while, uh, based on, based on the research. Um, even in, in non physique athletes who are just like really high training volume endurance athletes, when they do controlled studies to try to restore normal menstruation, sometimes it takes months and months and months. So what we're looking at here is clearly the, the neuromuscular capacity had not fully, fully come back to normal. Could it be a difference in training? Possibly. You know what I mean? Mm. Like sometimes people kind of lay, lay off the gas pedal a little bit in the first couple months after after a bodybuilding show. So we, we could be looking at someone who became detrained and just hasn't been absolutely killing it in the gym because they've you know, you work up to this big kind of crescendo, this big climax with your competition. It's normal to kind of be like, all right, well, I'm going to get in the gym when it when it suits me and, you know, get some workouts in and enjoy my time in the gym, not try to hit a squat PR every day. Mm. So it, it could be that whatever mechanism was contributing to that deficit had not yet recovered. It could be a transition in the way training was done. It, it could be a lot of different things. But what we certainly know is that recovery entails many different facets of your health and your performance, and they all seem to recover at different rates. Um, the one thing that you can do is approach your post competition recovery with a plan. And so mm. like nowadays you hear a lot of people talk about recovery reverse diet. dieting, yeah. and recovery dieting. And, uh, that to me, that's an exciting discussion because it's one that has to happen. Like we have to start having some kind of plan for it. And, uh, I think some people are missing with their approach 
in one direction of trying to gain too much weight too quick. I think some people are trying to stay way too lean after competition, which is also not ideal. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, the post competition period is something that really fascinates me. Yeah, no, for sure. And something else I wanted to ask you again to circle back to the, uh, I guess the drop in resting metabolic rate, you know, I guess what is your speculation on, um, you know, when you said, uh, this particular study with the females in comparison to males, we've seen the males, uh, you know, I know like Peter Fitchin's uh, studies and stuff like that. We've seen huge reduction in like testosterone, thyroid, like, uh, mood disorders, so, like all these like m- markers of well being and health just like go to the toilet and females seem to be just a little bit more robust and resilient to, I guess, you know, semi-starvation, uh, than what males are. It's almost as if, uh, they, they just, uh, yeah, don't uh, go down as easily as, as what men do. Is there any speculation as to why you think this may be? Is it like an evolutionary or biological, uh, you know, reasoning for preventing, uh, obviously, the death of females so that we can survive as a human race? Or is, it, is there something else at play here? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, you know, for, for a long time, we've known that there, you know, it, it's, this is the least controversial thing I've ever said. It's harder for a woman to get to 5% body fat than a man, <laughs> right? Like we just know that women, yeah. e- even women that are like absolutely contest ripped, uh, it's still going to be a higher body fat than what's expected of a male competitor because that is the way biology works. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, there are some really robust defense mechanisms mm-hmm. that, that keep women from getting to 5% body fat. Um, it, it could be evolutionary in nature. Um, but, but the thing that's really dictating that is the pretty pronounced hormone differences, right? Like the, the higher estrogen to testosterone ratio makes you absolutely more prone to having a higher general body fat percentage, right? Now, I wouldn't say that women don't see those effects of metabolic adaptation. So like, you know, we did a study looking at the post-competition period, right? Uh, It was a collaboration with Bill Campbell down at USF, who's one of my favorite researchers. I love Bill. He's awesome. But with that particular study, we had a mixed sample of males and females. And, you know, we didn't document a full prep, but what we did was we measured them right at the time of competition. And just based on normative values that we would expect, based on predictive equations, there there were absolutely women in that sample that were in rough shape, mm-hmm. really rough shape in terms of their hormone levels, their metabolic rate. So I, I think one of the problems with like, so, I mean, even in our female case study, we saw it, you know, like, it's not like, oh, metabolic rate was totally normal, but whereas with, with, with certain male case studies, we might see a more rap, like a more pronounced drop. Um, in, in the case of our study, you know, our participant came in at about 90% of what we would have predicted and then dropped to a little over 80%. That's still 20% mm. lower than we would think. It just wasn't this huge precipitous drop. And I think uh, it's very likely that she had been maintaining like a pretty low body weight prior to the prep. Like even at the start, she wasn't 100 percent of where we thought her metabolic rate would be. It was already low, Mm -hmm. which is part of why we didn't see a huge drop off like down a cliff. Yeah. One of the things that will stick out about male case studies when it comes to physique athlete prep, they usually have a higher absolute flux in weight Mm -hmm. you know like it's not it's not uncommon to see a a male physique athlete drop 30 40 pounds in a prep um you know so that that's one of the things that could be playing into it is that when these guys are going are starting these data collection processes they are fed you know what i mean Mm -hmm. like they are 100 (laughs) 110 percent of what we'd expect their metabolic rate to be they've been exactly yeah (laughs) they're coming in bulked up and ready to drop some weight uh, whereas I think it's more common in some female competitors to maintain a little closer to stage weight. Um, so I, I think there, there's a few things at play, but I, I definitely wouldn't say that, you know, that, mm, that yeah, sure. women aren't experiencing some really profound changes in hormone levels and, and some pretty marked suppression of metabolic rate when they get to competition time. I just think with guys, there's, there's the two factors. 
with males, a lot of times they'll drop more overall mass in their prep. And, you know, they're trying to get to, so, so sometimes with the, the female um, case studies and the small studies and physique athletes, you'll have females that are competing in the bikini and the figure class where mm-hmm. if they get too lean, they could be penalized, especially in bikini. Yep. And so one of the things it, that you have to factor into that is if you, you, you're just looking males and females, you also have to consider are the males uh, getting absolutely as lean as possible because of their bodybuilding division and even physique division in males is starting mm-hmm. to ask you to get pretty doggone lean. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't see a lot of physique people getting male physique, getting feedback saying, oh, you were too lean. I really don't see that. I only hear about people getting too big. Um, so I, I think another thing is that because it's part of the sport, you know, females competing in a bikini are not trying to get low because they shouldn't for their sport. Like, I'm not saying they, they couldn't, I'm saying that's not the point of a bikini class, you know? So you have to factor that in as well. Awesome, man. And I guess, uh, yeah, that's, uh, pretty much all we have time for today. It's been really cool to, to chat to you and obviously, yeah, flesh out these studies and just discuss uh what is something that's really important to the physique community and that's uh the gender differences that do exist um and i guess having more research on female populations so it's great to see and i i guess draw attention to that but my final question before we wrap up is what's next you've had a big couple of years where you're working with uh greg you're going to be writing articles doing audio stuff like that is that what you've got uh, pretty much penciled in for the next couple of months? Or is there any other projects, things you want to keep listeners up to date with? Yeah, so uh, I'll be doing a ton of stuff with Greg, a lot of articles. Um, we are, we, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I will. Uh, we have a podcast that will be in the works, uh, which awesome. certainly don't listen instead of this one. You listen <laughs> on top of this one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're trying to be the second best podcast in fitness behind you. Um <laughs> So we'll have that coming out. Um, I will, like I said, um, I will be basically loading up a full roster of clients within the next few months. So if you want to get in touch with me on social media, check me out at strongerbyscience.com. That's basically where I'll be living for the foreseeable future. Uh, I really appreciate you having me on today. And I also, let me, can I get one thing off my chest here? Of course you can. So I just did a podcast the other day and we talked a lot about like bodybuilding and after we stopped, I was like, like after we like ended the call, I was like, damn, I'm like really critical of bodybuilding. <laughs> so like one of the things that sucks about like some of the research we've done on bodybuilding is like we look at these adverse effects. We look at the fact that you have no testosterone and you can't sleep and you feel terrible. And I just want to reiterate, we do, we're, I'm doing this because I love it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I love bodybuilding and my goal is to help people figure out how they as athletes or they as coaches can help people do this more effectively, enjoy the process more throughout. And sometimes I talk about bodybuilders as if they're, they're like crazy. Mm-hmm. It's because they are. And that's awesome. Yeah. Like I love It's good that. to be different. Yeah. So like I, I got off a, a podcast the other day. I was like, Jesus, do I hate bodybuilding? Because I don't think I do. And I don't. But yeah, so when we talk about these things, my my lesson is not like don't do bodybuilding because bodybuilders are crazy and it sucks. My lesson is like let's continue as an entire field of coaches and practitioners and athletes. Let's keep trying to get better so that mm-hmm. we can do this enjoyably, more healthy. And uh, yeah, I always I always like make fun of bodybuilders because I am one, but it's awesome that we're willing to do stuff that defies our biology. Yep. Like that is what's cool about it. So uh, keep bodybuilding, keep trying to improve the way you do it time and time again, and don't let this research scare you away from doing it. Just use it as a a cautionary tale of here's the things that I could expect and here's some ways that we can try try to fix that or at least keep those changes as small as possible. Awesome, man. I totally agree. There's a lot of benefits afforded through the process of being a competitive bodybuilder. It's just knowing what you're signing up for, being aware of the inherent risks involved and making sure that you do things properly so that uh, you can navigate your way through with as as little uh, collateral damage as possible, I guess. But yeah, man, thank you so much for your time. 
Really appreciate it. Love your work. You're doing so many good things in the industry. And I'm sure you're only going to continue to do more and more bigger and better things over the course of 2019. Guys, make sure you check out Eric. He is producing, uh, well, he has produced a lot of research. Now he's going to be producing a lot of content. So you heard it here first. He is my top pick for the man who will blow up and explode in 2019. So get on him early while he's uh, a little bit less uh, known in the evidence-based community, I guess, um, because everyone's going to know who Eric Trexler is and you can tell all your friends that you heard about him first before they did. And that's what life's about, winning and beating your friends. Thank you, guys. Right. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.